And welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And on behalf of Mark and Alice and myself, we want to greet you in the name of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're glad that you can join us and be with us for this time in God's Word. We're continuing on, and uh, we will actually get into the Beatitudes. We're starting on the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. In this in this video in this in this program program this time together um, the last couple of uh, programs have been a lead up to that an important lead up to that just to get us all you know there has to be this kind of prelude to get ready for it so we've done that and we're ready to go after Mark asks God's blessing on our time together oh, Lord in your word it says to pursue righteousness love and peace. Lord, just show us where those are in your word so we can get some and spread them around. Amen. Amen. Well, as I said we, last week, as a matter of fact, last week we looked at the different translations, different versions of the Bible, so we would kind of be on the same page when we do this and be able to communicate one with another. And if you missed that, you might, it would be worth your while to go back and look at it last, yes, last week's pro program. Yes, yes it would. But I said we were going to start, and we're starting with the Beatitudes. We Last week, again, we read through all of them. Mm -hmm. But we're going to start now with the first one. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So we, we have to, first of all, consider the fact that Jesus chose this to be the opening statement of this sermon. Yes. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's not an accident no. or just random. The statement is foundational to receiving and understanding the entire teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's not, it, he does nothing without purpose. Absolutely. Okay? Mm -hmm. So there's a purpose for this being the first one. Mm -hmm. You know, Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said that God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. But all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. There's an order to what God yes. speaks here, right? That was from 1 Corinthians 14, by the way. So, God is not a God of confusion. He's a God of good order. And here are some points to consider, to understand, that we need to understand as we're getting into this. The first one is that the poor, blessed are the poor in spirit, the poor are always, by definition, needy and therefore dependent on others. All right? The second thing is we are poor in spirit while already having the greatest treasure. Okay, so I just want to put those in the back of your, our minds as we get into this. The poor in spirit are dependent, totally dependent. Being poor by its very nature means that one's unable to meet his or her own needs. Right. Right? Okay. Yeah. Unless we recognize our dependence on the Lord, starting with the free gift of salvation, paid for by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and then for everything else we need, will fall into the trap of pride. Yes. That's why this is so important, okay? Yeah. Understanding, recognizing, admitting to the fact that you are poor in spirit, that you are in need, will keep you from pride. That's amazingly important. Well, because pride is the gateway to all sin. That, and that can be seen, listen to these verses. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty, a haughty spirit before a fall. That's Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. And think of the, the great fall, right? Yeah. The great fall starts with, For God knows that in that day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God. That's what the serpent said to the woman. Right. Right. He's playing on pride, right? right? Mm -hmm. that you'll be like God. Well, oh my goodness. What, a better, what better thing can there be than to be like God? Which, by the way, is his promise to us coming, right? Okay? So Solomon, with his God-given wisdom, wrote in Proverbs 6, starting well, verse 16 is where it starts. It says that there are six things which the Lord hates, 
yea, even seven, which are an abomination to him. And the first of those is hoi eyes, pride. Because that leads into all the other sins. And Paul wrote to Timothy, speaking of the perilous last days, talking about the failings of the so-called church and mankind in general, talking about those perilous last days. Mm -hmm. And he started by saying, for men will be lovers of self. It's about pride that leads into all of the rest. Now, the second item in that list that Paul wrote to Timothy in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, is after lovers of self comes lovers of money, right? Money, or more precisely wealth, gives a person a sense of independence. Mm -hmm, yeah. So the Spirit moved Paul to warn Timothy to instruct others, those who have riches, that they should not fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. 1 Timothy 6.17 you see, and, and that worldly fixation on money will be much more exposed later on in this Sermon on the Mount mm -hmm. when Jesus starts talking about being able to, choosing to serve God or mammon, right? right. You know, I, I've had just, I've had the opportunity all through my life uh, to know an awful lot of very, very wealthy people. Very, very wealthy people. And one of the great dangers and one of the things I found is that they become they become proud. They become pride because they credit themselves with earning, you know, having having those funds. But more importantly, they become they become proud of their independence. They don't depend on anybody else, okay? Because they depend. They're, they're being dependent. They're being dependent on their money, okay? Right. Yeah. But that's they don't understand that, right? Because we're supposed to be humble, and humility is the opposite of pride. And that's the gateway to all of God's blessings. Yes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, right? Humility. The reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. That's Proverbs 22, 4. So God rewards that humility, right? Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you, James said, James 4, 10. We were unable to save ourselves. That's right. There's not a thing in the world. You can't go to church enough. You can't go. You can't tithe enough. You can't Give burn up. enough oxen, mm -hmm. and you can't do anything to bring yourself your own salvation. Mm -hmm. That took the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Yes. Period. So we were totally dependent on Jesus to accomplish to bring us back into a right state with God the Father. That was God meeting that need in our lives. Mm -hmm. We were dependent on Him, and He met that need. Right. Well, you know what? He'll meet all of our needs. Isn't that the promise? promise? Yes. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19. So we are dependent on riches. We're dependent on God's riches. And we are dependent on his grace and love that he has promised to meet all of our needs. So this being poor in spirit is not so much about what you have as it is about being being about what you consider to be your own. Right. All right? And understanding the source mm -hmm. of what we have. I did a teaching uh, quite a number of years ago called Ownership, Stewardship, and, and Possession. possession. Yes. Okay? You don't own it, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, why? It's not yours. Whatever it is, it's not yours. Because it says in Psalms 24, 1, The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. It all belongs to God. When the, when the Lord created the earth, he gave man stewardship. He gave him dominion, stewardship, and gave him possession. But he never gave him ownership. The earth is the Lord's. It's still his. It all belongs to the Lord our God. Even you don't belong to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is where it, we have to understand this, okay? Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price? Right. Are you responsible for it? Of course, that's stewardship. 
you have do you have possession? Of course you have possession of it. You're you know you're you're walking around in it. But it belongs to God. Being poor in spirit is first and foremost about establishing the lordship of Jesus Christ. Amen. In our hearts. Mm. You know, you, you can you can quote the scriptures and sing the song. Mm -hmm. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. But if he made it, he owns it. Right. He is only entrusting you with this day. And you are responsible for it, but he owns it. And you're responsible to him for it because it still belongs to him. He's allowing you to use it. He's, yes, he's allowing you to use this day. That's right. hmm. In order for this teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, to make sense, we need to understand that Jesus is Lord of all. Yes. Lord of all. all. Our money, our families, our time, our jobs, all. He is Lord of all of it. We've been conditioned to hear the words poor, the word poor, poor in spirit, right? Or, or rich. And we immediately think of and focus on money. Absolutely. You can be poor in anything. Right. When Jesus said, "Blessed are the poor in spirit," it's because we recognize that we don't possess, we don't own anything. Okay, but He has entrusted us with all good things. It's not even our own love. It's it's, it's not. God's it's the love of God has been poured, poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Right. Everything that we have that is good came it's from God. God, and to God be the glory. Amen. Okay. You know, I don't know if you're going to get into this or not. I might be. Jumping, Do, jumping the gun a little bit, but in the Gospels somewhere, G G Jesus and the d disciples were observ uh, observing the people in the temple, and one man came in, stayed in the back, and all he could do was beat his chest because he was he re felt repenting. he felt so unworthy. Mm -hmm. A Pharisee came in and he said, "Look how." He's up in the front. I, I'm just glad I'm not like that guy. Right. And this verse, and Jesus said that that guy left, the guy that beat his chest, left more righteous than the Pharisee did. That's exactly right. That's what we're talking about. Because you recognized that in, in you, you have nothing good in yourself nothing. other than what God has poured into you. Mm -hmm. We are totally dependent on God. Absolutely. The, the problem is, you have we are righteous. We are the very righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But the Pharisee thought that he was righteous because of what he did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because of, you know. He tithed. Well, because of, because of his religious activity, he thought he was he righteous. righteous. Yeah. So he wasn't dependent on God. He was dependent on himself. Now, is the word poor, if you do a word study on the word poor, would it mean dependent rather than poor? It mean what, it, what the word poor means. And you I mean, listen. I told you before. Use a dictionary. Go to the dictionary, and you'll find you, you'll you'll find that the word poor just means needy. Right, needy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When you recognize that you are needy, mm -hmm. that you can, that you're not the answer to your own problems, and then typically what the world does, the people in the world turn to the world to meet their needs, and the world fails over and over and over and over. But God never fails. And when you turn to the Lord and cry out to the Lord, He will meet your need. Right. But we're all dependent. Okay? Just the majority of people don't recognize it. And they don't want to be dependent. That's pride. Pride says, you know, you don't want to be dependent on somebody else. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ means that you recognize that you cry out to God for all good things. And the, crying out to the world is, for your needs is an illusion. And you'll be disillusioned at the Absolutely. end of the day. In the Strong's here, it says it's being a, a, a beggar. Well, why does a beggar beg? Because he's in need. He's in need. Yeah. Poor is about being in need. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we talk about money and wealth and stuff, if there's any bias in the word about wealth, it would have to seem to be a bias against the affluent, yes. against those who have riches. Yeah. Because there seems to be a clear and present danger that's associated with riches. Mm -hmm. I mean, let me read you some verses and think about this. 
Two things I ask of you, do not refuse me before I die. Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I might not be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Okay? Or that I might not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. That's Proverbs. Proverbs 30, verses 7 through 9. So, you know, riches will, I mean, there's such a danger to riches because all of a sudden you believe that they meet your needs. And this is how mammon becomes a god, an idol. Because, and, and that's what it says, greed is idolatry. Because you trust in those riches to meet your needs. God will meet your needs. If you're stealing, that's because you're going out and again, you think that you have to get what you need from the world. And that's why Paul wrote to Timothy and said, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. There's such a danger. You know, the money is a neutral thing. Money is a neutral thing. It's a tool. It's the love of money. It is that dependence on money. It is that trust in money. Idolize, it, idolizing it. That turns it into an idol. Absolutely. So why is that important? Because the error is so widely preached in the church. This, this, this love of money, this focus on money, is preached so so many parts of the church. And But that's not new. You know, Paul wrote to Titus about that 2,000 years ago, and he said, for there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, mm -hmm. teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. Oh, yeah. there, are a lot of, there are a lot of people out there standing behind pulpits or standing you know, before cameras, and, and they're preaching things for the sordid gain, to get things from you. Right. All right? If we look at these scriptures, these are just a sampling of the word. And I want to say that, like I said, riches is not the problem. The desire for riches is, right? For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. 1 Timothy 6.10 If you believe that your God, that our God, will meet all of your needs through His riches and glory in Christ Jesus... You don't need to desire the riches to get stuff. You need to trust in God to get the things that you need. Is there a bias? Is there a bias? Listen to this. And Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up and read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened, this was in the beginning, right? And he opened the book and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. The needy. The needy. Later on in, in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were astonished. They were very astonished and said, then who can be saved? I mean, do you really want to, you, you really, this is the word of God. Okay? You want to you want to create a hindrance in your life? Money can be, you know, listen, you're no better off driving, you know, a 40-year-old Volkswagen than you are a brand new Rolls Royce. It's not about what you have. It's about what you have in your heart. Blessed are the poor in spirit. It doesn't say, Jesus did not say, blessed are the poor in their bank accounts. It's about what you are, what's in your heart. And if in your heart is a love of God, a trust of God, you know, trust that he will meet your needs, then you're going to be okay. But if you're trusting in him, you will be satisfied. Because ultimately, I'm going to tell you this is the truth. Jesus said, no, I will get into this a lot more in depth later on. No man can serve two masters. Talking about God or mammon. You'll, you'll love the one and hate the other. We're here to grow in the word. But think about what Jesus said in the Gospel of Mark, talking about the parable of the sower of the seed. And he said, Others are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word, but the worries of the world 
and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word until it becomes unfruitful. There is danger. The things that we find so attractive in the world are dangerous to the spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation towards those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in the thoughts of their heart. And he has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. Luke 1, 49-53. You know, did I say there's a danger? Think about, listen, this is the Word of God. These are things Jesus said. I'm not making this up. And again, in the Gospel of Luke in the 6th chapter, Jesus said, But woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. I don't want my comfort in full from what the world can give me. Because that will disappear. It's going to burn up. That's right. I, I have so many more verses. I mean, talk about this. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Don't trust in money. Yeah. Don't trust in money. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those, I promise you, the disciples. And remember, he's speaking to his disciples. He said, you're blessed when you understand it's not what you have. It's not what you have the ability to get. It's what I want to desire, what I desire to give you. All the things that you need. Okay? And we do. Trust me. It was true 2,000 years ago. It's true today. We treat people who have money differently than people who are poor. Most definitely. Much to our shame. Yes. Much to our shame. Listen, 2,000 years ago, James said this. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring, dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes. And you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith? and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love them. Mm -hmm. James 2, verses 2 to 4. Are you hearing this? Mm -hmm. Like I said, I'm never making any of this up. This is the word of God. The problem is, we're not hearing this word of God no, from not. too many pulpits. No. You're hearing more of what the world offers than what the word offers. Think, think about this where the church winds up in the, in the, the last picture of a church on earth. In the book of Revelation, that seventh church is the church of Laodicea. And listen to what Jesus says to the church at Laodicea. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And eyes have to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Revelation 3, 17 to 18. That is a church that literally made Jesus sick to his stomach. Sick to his stomach. Yes. Why? Because they are filled with pride, boasting in their wealth that they can take care of anything that they need. All right? Jesus said it. It's the deceitfulness of riches. It's mammon. It takes people's eyes and trust from the Lord and places it squarely on the world. That's right. Let me say one more time. Whatever it is, whatever it is, animal, person, thing, God owns it. Yes. The love of money has been cultivated in the church for a long, long time. Okay? And this goes back into the Old Testament. I mean, remember the story of Elisha and Naaman the leper? Yes. yes. And Naaman comes and he doesn't even reach Elisha. Elisha sends a message to him and says, just go dip in the Jordan seven times and you'll be healed. Well, Naaman, first of all, got upset because that wasn't grand enough for him to do. Mm -hmm. But he was obedient and went and did it. 
And then after he was healed by the Lord, he wanted to bless Elisha with things, right. with wealth. Mm -hmm. And Elisha said, no. Uh, okay, how many, how many preachers do you see on television today would turn away mm -hmm. when somebody says, oh, you bless me, I want to give you this. And they'll say, no. no. <laughs> so Gehazi, Elisha's servant, goes running off after Naaman mm -hmm. and gets the money from him. And you know what? Not only did he get the money, oh he got goodness. the leprosy. Yes, he did. This is what I see so much of in the church. People running after wealth, using ministry as a tool. Well, isn't that what I said in the beginning? Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're in their ministry for sordid gain. Yes. I, I really don't want to get into this too much. But you don't have to go too far. If you, have, if you open your, the eyes of your heart, and seek the Spirit of God for the truth. And look around at the church that developed after the apostolic period. When they started building these grand cathedrals. And there was such conspicuous wealth and consumption in the leadership of the church. Yes. Well, that's, that's the today. culture of the church. That's become the culture of the yes. church. Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, said, you know... The, the foxes have dens, the bird of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Are we trying to follow Jesus, or are we following the world? Are we being conformed to the world, or are we being transformed by the renewing of our mind and the words of God to, to think differently? Well, I don't, I'm, I, as always, I'm running short of time. But blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Is that what it says? Yes. Yes. Okay. Does it say, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs shall be the kingdom of heaven? There's is. is. Presently. Is. Present. Now, a lot, of the, a lot of the Beatitudes are shall, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They shall, they shall, yes. they, they shall. You can see Martin. second, third, fourth, yeah, fifth, okay. Okay. sixth, seventh. I want you to know that, you know, there's an old, old hymn I'm talking about the great by and by. And there, there are great rewards waiting for us in the by and by. Mm -hmm. And the place we're going is far better than the place that we are. But the simple fact of the matter is the kingdom of heaven is ours now. That's right. The kingdom of heaven is ours now. I'm going to close on this real quick. Years ago, Alice and I lived down in Naples, Florida, when, after we had come back from Central America. And there was, now, Naples, Florida at the time was a bastion of... Mm -hmm incredible wealth. I mean, there's so many people. I, when we first got there, it may be different now. I said, you, you'd see more Rolls Royces than Chevrolets. Mm -hmm. We, by the way, <laughs> we're not a monk. God put us there. We didn't have any wealth. We had come back from, from Central America without pretty much anything. We saw a guy or a, a family was building an, a mansion on the water. Amazing. An incredible. It looked like a country club. Mm -hmm. But he was living in a trailer next when he went down to it, next to it. You know, that house was his, but he was living in a trailer. You may be living in a trailer now, but I promise you that house is being built. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Amen. That place is ours now, yes. not, not just in the life to come, but the blessings of God are ours right. today. Just waiting for a move-in date. Hallelujah. <laughs> so start to walk in faith and live in the fullness of the blessings of God today. And Father, we thank you for all your good blessings. We thank you, Lord God, that you do provide and meet all of our needs. We thank you, Lord God, that we can trust in you. Lord, that you love us so much you gave your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. What other good thing would you withhold? God bless you, and goodbye. Till next time. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame But I love that old cross Where the dearest and best For a world of lost sin 